Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano with Margin of Safety Investing and Fundamental Trends. Going to be using my Seeking Alpha articles today to do a little review of what's been going on and what I think it's going to lead to. As you know, I spent two weeks in Las Vegas playing in the World Series of Poker. There are about 100 tournaments as part of that series. And the Golden Nugget, uh, Orleans, Venetian, the Win. They also all run their own poker tournament series. So there's a lot of poker in Las Vegas in June uh, into the middle of July. So I thought I'd write this article, Investing Lessons from World Series of Poker. It is up at the premium side of Seeking Alpha. I will make copies of this to the services here today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow. And I thought that I'd go over just a few things about investing that I thought would be important. These guys are some of the early legends of poker. Johnny Moss, Chill Wills, Amarillo Slim, Jack Binion of Hotel fame, and Puggy Pearson, who is a guy that I think was pretty prescient. His quote is this. There ain't only three things to gambling. Knowing the 60-40 end of a proposition, money management, and knowing yourself. So I covered that in the context of investing. And I think that knowing yourself is a pretty important lesson. And most people, in my experience as an investment advisor, is that most people don't know themselves. They'll say things like, you know, I can take a lot of risk. You know, I really want to make what the market makes or more. But then anytime there's a drawdown in the account because things don't go right or the market just has a big correlated correction that's hard to get out of the way of, they panic. I've more than once in my career had somebody say, sell all my stuff after it's already down 20%. And I'm like, you know, the market's down 35 and we're down 20. We should actually be adding money. And it just is the nature of people's emotions that they're not honest with themselves about what their risk tolerance really is going in. And being ignorant of how the markets work and how companies work and thinking that okay is good enough really fails most investors. It's why about 80% of investors cannot beat the market. Never have, probably never will. So if you accept what your true risk tolerance is, then you will have a better outcome. And one thing to always keep in mind is that if you are an indexer, while you will get 99.9% .9 of what the market returns, if the market is the S&P 500, you will trail when the S&P 500 doesn't lead, which is really about half the time. Lately, that has not been the case, but historically it has been. And usually there is a reversion to mean, even if the mean is changing just a little bit at a time. You'll also be getting 100% of the risk of the market. So if you are invested in 500 companies via the S&P 500, you are taking, by definition of investing in that index, 100% of the risk of that index. And the risk of that index is similar to small caps or international. Not, not the same, but similar. So you have to understand that you're really doing nothing for risk mitigation if you are an indexer. And if you are an indexer, by proxy or a closet indexer, meaning that you own lots and lots of stuff. Even if you don't buy the index, you just own lots of different things that kind of make you mirror the index. You're taking a lot of risk. And I don't think people understand the concept of risk until they're down and they panic. Again, not everybody, but probably about 80% of folks. So I do think that knowing yourself and in the context of what risk really is, is an important lesson. Money management. We sell a lot of options, and the reason that we do it is because that we're always recycling money back into our account by selling options. Now, if you're retired, you don't have income to just constantly put money into your investments. And dollar cost averaging or buying the dips, really, are the best ways to invest. Dollar cost averaging is kind of on a schedule, and that's a pretty good method. I've shown charts before that show that buying the dips, really buying any 5% dip, is usually a great time to invest. People are like, oh, it's down 5%. Should I wait for it to be down 7%? It's down 10%. Should I wait for it to be down 15%? Really, if you are buying ETFs or mutual funds or big baskets of stocks, the 
to 10% corrections are almost all viable. And over history, that has proven to be true. There are one or two instances per decade where the corrections are bigger and you have to avoid those. Back at the end of 2021, I told people to sell almost everything. And if you had waited until the second half of 2022, you would have avoided about 15 to 20% of that correction or 15 to 20 points of that correction. And then you could have scaled your way back in, which is what we started doing. We started buying the small caps way back in 2022, probably a year too early, such is life. The reality is that in this market, we have seen something that I'm going to title in an article, uh, Naked Shorts and Nefarious Underlords, a uh, 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 coordinated shorting of small company stocks because they're not getting the inflows from the S&P 500, which is unfortunately what half of people invest in now. So we have more extreme markets and that probably doesn't go away for a long time. I'd imagine it stays this way throughout the 2020s and probably until there's a major, major bear market. And then maybe after that, it changes a little bit, but who knows? People tend to reinforce their misbeliefs through rationalization and bad analysis. And I'm not so sure that we won't see more extreme extremes. On the small cap side, we are seeing extreme undervaluation, extreme undervaluation. The most undervalued small cap index that I've ever seen in my career, uh, I believe it's, this goes back to the 1970s now, and we are very likely to see a period, Tom Lee talks about 12 years potentially, I don't think it'll be that long, but we're likely to see a period of outperformance of small caps start with the next rate cut cycle that suddenly is right in front of our face. It was slow until it was sudden. And after the inflation numbers this week, I think it's pretty clear that the Federal Reserve, if they don't cut in July in a month, they'll at least talk about, we're ready. We need one or two more months of data, and then we'll probably be ready. I think there's a good possibility that we get one more good inflation print, because there is one more coming before the next meeting. And that might be enough for Powell to say, hey, we're going to do a cut. We don't know how fast we're going to do more cuts, but it looks like we're starting to turn over on the cuts. The thing to watch out for at that point, of course, is not to spook the market. I don't think that will happen. I think everybody is of the same opinion as I am. At least the big money is, is of the same opinion I am, which is that in order to fund the U.S. Treasury deficit, we have to have lower interest rates. So I think that's coming. With your money management, selling cash secured puts, selling covered calls, depending on whether something is overbought or oversold, overvalued or undervalued, really overvalued, you should just sell a, sell a position, but overbought and fairly valued, probably sell a covered call. And I'm going to write a new retirement income options article uh, just titled Selling Options. And we'll talk about the times where you should be doing certain things uh, because I think that a lot of people get confused by the other bullshit that's out there about covered call strategies and buy rights and strangles and straddles and struggles and everything else that's out there. If you can manage your money in a way where you are bringing in a few percent of income every month, that means that you always have dry powder to invest during one of those buy the dip moments. So if you have an income because you're working, you should be contributing on an ongoing basis. And if you are retired, you need to find a way to have income to put back into the markets when there is a dip that is viable. Selling options is far and away the best way to do that. So again, I implore anybody who doesn't know how to sell options, make that a mission in your life. Get some books, read up online at the Options Institute and learn how to be a cash secured put seller and a covered call seller. Your brokerage will have great resources on that, whether you're using Fidelity or Schwab or Interactive Brokers. And then finally, be on the right side of the 60-40. In poker, there's an end game, right? You're trying to beat everybody else and be the last man standing. You have to eventually take a gamble when you invest. Excuse me. You eventually have to take a gamble when you play poker. In investing, you don't have to take a gamble. You don't have to reach out for risk. Annie Duke was a professional poker player during the big boom years, and she is now writing business books. 
And one of her big lessons is avoid hard decisions, period. In poker, you avoid hard decisions until you have to make a hard decision. I try to get into the money part of a tournament before I gamble. That used to be the best way to get into the money in a poker tournament. I think that's changed in poker because there's so many good players now. With investing, though, Warren Buffett throws out another analogy, which is investing is really like a baseball game where there's no called strikes. Nobody can tell you that you have to swing. So you can wait for really good opportunities that can turn into great opportunities because you never actually know at the moment. You just think you know. And if you look for great or things that can be great and avoid everything else, really 80% of the stock market or 90% of the stock market, you should never buy the stock. You just own stuff within an ETF in an industry that you think is going to do well, comparatively speaking, because all investing really is relative investing. You know, if this is okay, but this is better, which one do you want? You should invest in the one that's better. Pretty simple concept. So the difference here between investing and, and gambling is in gambling, you do by rule have to try to get lucky. With investing, you know, you'll take luck, but you're not looking for luck. You're looking for more certainty. Buffett also talks about taking less risk to make more money. And that is a concept that for some reason, people have a hard time wrapping their head around because of the old saying, you know, more risk, more reward. And that's bullshit. It's actually less risk, more reward. And that's what we have to try to do. Avoid big permanent drawdowns, right? Volatility is different than a big permanent drawdown. Volatility is just the emotions of the market. And we do our best to try to deal with overbought and oversold conditions. What we really want to avoid is a company like OnTrack, where the primary owner of the company, the, the leading shareholder and CEO, pillages the company somehow. Or a public company like Warner Brothers Discovery, where the CEO Zasloff makes more money than the shareholders. Those are the things you want to avoid. On track, permanent loss. Warner Brothers Discovery, probably a loss for a very long time. We'll see what happens with that. But as you know, we have exited the streaming stocks, Paramount and Warner, mainly because management has been so bad. And that's another lesson for investing is you have to invest in good management. And if you run into bad management, run away from them. Because one way or another, they're going to get you either by managing a company poorly or just lining their own pockets at the expense of you, the shareholder. And that is way more common than it should be because, frankly, we don't, we don't prosecute those people. We let them get away with it. In fact, we vote CEOs billion-dollar pay packages now on the promise of something that might happen five or ten years out. All right, let's move on. Just a list of some of the articles this year. So let's cover 24 things that will absolutely happen in 2024. I thought that this was a pretty good article. I thought it was fun. If you haven't read it, go back and read it. Bitcoin, I said, would reach $100,000 with the ETF approvals. Uh, it's been up towards 70000 And when I wrote this, it was down in the 20s, I believe. So we'll see how well this does by the end of the year. I said the stock market is unlikely to experience a crash. My target for the S&P 500 was 5,720 this year. One of the highest projections for the S&P 500. I said this back when the S&P 500 was in the middle, middle 4,000s, I believe. We're at 5,460, and other analysts are raising their projections to catch up to me. I believe that 5,700 is still a pretty good guess for the end of the year. We might even make a run at 6,000. I think there's a possibility that the S&P 500 makes a run at 7,000 next year and 10,000 by the end of the decade. But think about the gain from here to 10,000. That's less than a double. And I do think there will be a crash by the end of the decade. The transition to a highly retired economy, especially President Trump wins re-election, we are going to see major problems with immigration. One of the things that if you watch Wall Street a week today that was talked about, I can't remember if it was, a, it was a, the guy from Evercore or from Calsters, they talked about how immigration has really helped the U.S. economy. If we start deporting people and completely blocking immigration, 
by definition, and just understand the economic implications here. By definition, if your workforce stops growing, your economy will stop growing. We cannot afford to not replace the boomers who are retiring. So the 10,000 boomers that are retiring every day or whatever it is, we need that many new workers every single day. And we're only getting about one third of them from people turning working age. So we need thousands of people per day, per day, come into this country and put them into the labor force. And this is going to be the case until around 2030. We need a lot of people in this country to keep growing the economy. So the people who think America first is smart, people who think that we should be locking the borders down, the people who think that we should, you know, have super high tariffs, tariffs by definition are inflationary, not having immigration would be deflationary, and that is a recipe for stagflation, something that uh, President Trump's own economic advisor, Cohen, talked about way back in 2017 before he quit. If you are afraid of inflation, and naturally speaking, we shouldn't be, but we're kind of doing it to ourselves right now, or we were. I mean, we've pretty much beaten inflation. That's why the Fed can lower interest rates soon. If we bring inflation back through tariffs and harsh immigration policy, then we're doing it to ourselves. On the small cap front, I said when rates come down, expect small caps to rally. Looks like we're finally there a couple quarters later than I thought it would take, but you know, we're finally there. He said there won't be a recession this year, and we will get the teased soft landing. He said this all in January, and here we are having a soft landing. Commercial real estate mess will only result in a mini banking crisis, and the Fed will fix it pretty quickly with rate cuts and dialing down quantitative tightening, which they already started doing a month ago. So here is the most fun prediction I made, which if you watched the debate the other night, um, you may think that I might be right on the money. I suggested back in January that Joe Biden will drop, drop out of the presidential contest. Um, we'll see. I think that there was a bit of a trap laid in the debate. One of the things that Trump said, President Trump, you know, he still gets that title. He was a president. was that he probably wouldn't be running if Biden wasn't running. Well, I think Biden has the perfect opportunity to say, well, you know what? I'm going to drop out if you drop out. Or I'm dropping out so you drop out. I think that the trap has been set. And I originally thought that Governor Whitmore would be the uh, nominee, even though uh, it is pretty clear that politics say that Gavin Newsom should be the nominee at this point. That's how the system is set up. So I'm going to go with Gavin Newsom and Governor Whitmer in the Oval Office, with a pen, become the ticket in the next couple of weeks. And there will be an online vote of the electors at the behest of President Biden. The rules on the nomination can be changed at any time. And I think by the end of July, Newsom and Whitmer will probably be the ticket. I, I don't see Biden going on. I know that they're putting up a front right now as they think things through, but it is clear that Trump is at least a coin flip in all of the swing states, and they have to do something about that. With Whitmer being from the heart of the swing states and Newsom really probably having as much charisma as Bernie Sanders, I, I think that this is a pretty good ticket. Will I be right? I don't know. As far as the Milwaukee Brewers winning the World Series, they have the third best record in the National League, and they need one more pitcher and one more hitter. We'll see if billionaire Mark Antanasio decides to spend a couple dollars by absorbing somebody else's contracts. Again, I suggested 57.20 on the S&P 500. Apparently it was 472 when I said that. Here we are at 5,400 and the S&P 500 is up 15%. I don't think a lot of people believe that when I said it. I still don't think that they necessarily believe it. I've been seeing all sorts of reports that, hey, the market's gonna be choppy the rest of the year. I do think there will be a small correction in tech. I said this two weeks ago, and so far it has happened in the last two weeks of June. Uh, NVIDIA, after a moment being at $4 trillion in market cap, is down to $3.5 trillion. Apple has held up well because everybody expects a big uh, replacement cycle because of AI. 
I think they're probably a little ahead of themselves, but it's going to happen and it's going to start by Christmas. So, you know, you have the market um, doing market things, right? It's doing some rotation. For the rest of the market to do well, you need an expansion of breadth. We haven't seen that yet. The last time we saw 90% of stocks going up at the same time was the second half of 2021. So when the leadership in the market expanded from a narrow 10 or 20 companies to hundreds of companies, that marks and has always marked the top of a market cycle. We're not there yet. So as the smaller companies and the mid-sized companies and the other S&P 500 companies all start to do well on the realization that AI is transformational and will improve margins for growing companies in particular, you're going to see a wave of earnings improvements over the next couple of years, maybe over the next four or five years. That's very good for the stock market in general. And if we can avoid some sort of self-induced recession by screwing with immigration or screwing with tariffs, and then we can actually have America be first by doing smart things rather than reactionary right-wing bullshit that generally leads to wars. We'll see. I think that you want to buy the dips on technology, but I also think that industry is a great place to be. And I think select retail stocks are going to do very well. Think about what Target is doing with their new marketplace. Target is interesting to me. Am I going to get the valuation that I would need to buy it? I don't know. But I think Target's marketplace, because that is a beloved stock by by women, could do very well. It, It can very likely replace a lot of the stuff that normally gets bought on Amazon. And and I'll say, I'm a regular Amazon shopper, but I get so frustrated by their algorithm pointing me in directions that I didn't ask for. I can tell it exactly what I want, and it gives me 50 other things. I want this, this size, this color, this thing. What about this, 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 and this? You know, if I was drinking beer instead of tea, I would say, fuck off, Amazon. Instead, I'll say Zuck off. I, I always forget about that. I think Target is interesting. I think Kohl's, because of the real estate value, if they can continue to transition to more online sales, and I don't know if they're part of the Target marketplace, they should be, then you could see them do very well as well. And that's just a company I'm very intimate with. I know the company inside and out. We'll see. There are a lot of other places too. Uh, residential real estate is overvalued, uh, but builders... If we get a correction in builders, that would be good. Uh, For whatever reason, they don't come down in price because I think everybody knows that they're going to be busy for 10 years. So we'll see. There's a lot of good companies and a lot of great companies, but you don't necessarily get the margin of safety on their share price to make it worth risking your capital. And that's what you're looking for is the combination of a, a great business with a fair or undervalued price. So let's talk about some of those. Ametis, I think, is dramatically undervalued against its assets. I think you basically get the business for free. They just got added to the Russell 2000 last night. There's about 5 million shares that the market has to buy because of the index funds. And then there are a bunch of other catalysts that are coming. We recently found out that, and if you remember this, when I interviewed Eric McAfee, the CEO, he talked about watch the hiring in India as your signal to when the IPO will be. Well, they just hired a new CEO in India. So it is likely that we see that IPO in the second half of this year. And they have other catalysts that are coming, more tax credits. The LCFS will finally get approved as, at the end of the year um, and everything else. I know people want to say, oh, but if Trump wins, he's going to repeal everything. Folks, he doesn't have that power. He just doesn't. And he can tie up money a little bit for a little while, force things through the court system, which he would lose again. But the reality is that even if he causes a recession, which I think he would, everything still comes back around and capital spent is already capital spent. It's just the way that it is. Innovated industrial, since we talked about it, uh, has done very well, has beaten the market handily. So when I talked about innovative industrial, it was under 80. It's over, I think it's 110 right now beaten the S&P 500 by 17 points. 
plus is still paying that big fat dividend. I still own this, and I think I'll probably own it for a very long time. Ford really hasn't done anything yet. I think that it's a screaming buy right now. So if you don't own it, I think it's time to start adding it or selling cash secured puts. I just had some cash secured puts uh, expire. It's about a 2% position for me, and I'm looking to get it into that 3 to 4% range. I'll sell more cash secured puts soon. I talked about energy. It hasn't really done much since I've been talking about it. This article got published on the free side, on the premium side. Uh, but, you know, we've been buying Permian Resources and Occidental, uh, New Fortress Energy for a couple of years now. And they've all really done well. AI data centers are going to increase energy needs on net by 5 or 6%. That's still a pretty big jump, and this is by the end of the decade. So there are a lot of needs for energy. Almost 100% of all new energy demand is being met by new solar and wind, mostly solar at this point. Natural gas continues to replace coal. And if President Biden wins or Newsom or whoever, if the Democrats win the presidency, that will continue and it will accelerate. If President Trump wins, you could see some backing off on that. However, He's very pro-exporting energy, and they really both are. One thing to keep in mind is there's this bad narrative that somehow uh, President Biden is holding back the oil and gas industry. Folks, we have record production of oil, record production of natural gas, and record exports. You know, <laughs> there's no holding them back. The only thing that he has done is enforced methane restrictions so they can't flare anymore. Now there's a penalty on flaring. So about 90% of flaring is gone across the country and the rest will be gone soon because they, you know, you, can, you just can't afford to flare. It's too, the penalty is too big now. It's a penalty they should have had eight years ago. It, it never made sense that we were burning off natural gas. So that natural gas finds its way into the system. What are the oil and gas producers doing? They're building power plants right next door to their gas fields. And they're using that to electrify their own operations and to feed, especially in Texas, feed electricity into the grid. So within a year or two, I would guess that Texas doesn't have the weakness of their grid uh, that, they, that they have had. So expect for natural gas demand to remain strong one way or the other. Uh, Biden pausing new approvals for LNG exports is probably smart because we really don't want to run into a situation where we're short on natural gas because it's all getting exported. There's a lot of gas being exported. It probably makes sense for us to pause. And I, remember, I talked about this a few years ago. I said, look, they have too many LNG plants planned, and we're going to get to the point where we have too many, and it's going to screw up the system. It makes sense to build fewer of them in the future. And that's all that the Biden administration has been saying. And he's right. Whether he can articulate that or not, another story. But it doesn't mean he's wrong. Streaming stocks we covered, they suck. Kotera Energy, back to the energy play. I, I do think, since I mentioned this, it's down a couple points. You ought to be buying Kotera. They're either going to make a lot of money or they're going to go through some sort of M&A and you're going to make a lot of money. I, I, I really don't see how you can't make money on Kotera. There's almost no downside. And then the micro caps, uh, I believe five out of six of these ended up getting on the Russell 2000. I'll have to double check. But Ametis got on, Spire Global got on, American Superconductor got on, and this one's had a big rally. I actually trimmed into the rally this week uh, just to make it an essentially free position. Still have a position. Applied Optio Electronics has not gone up yet. I think that this is one that you can probably add to. And then Quick Logic hasn't really gone up either yet. It's been flat. So AAOI is down a little bit. Buy it. Quick Logic is flat. I think you can buy this one too. All right. Let's finish off with something I said back in February the great normalization. And I talked about how interest rates were not high, that really they were historically average. And, and they are. That is still too high for what we need to do with ca capital spending for the energy transition and to build homes. Those are the two big things that require lower interest rates. So it'll happen. We've already seen a tripling of industrial expansion in the United States over the last three years. It's a record. There's been more reshoring and onshoring in the last three years 
than ever before. And the rate at which it happened was triple what it was happening under President Trump, who talked that game but did not deliver. President Biden, who can't talk that game, has delivered. Jerome Powell understands that the neutral interest rate, despite the narrative from certain people that it has to be higher because of inflation, understands, and again, I was not a big Powell guy at the front end, I, I've come to believe that the normal neutral interest rate is about 3%, maybe 2 two to 3%. Why? Because you need those lower rates to fund the energy transition and the building of at least 10 million more homes over the next five to 10 years. And really, we probably need 20 million new homes if we're going to allow corporations to continue sucking up the inventory and turning everybody into a renter. We should pass a law that limits corporate corporate ownership of homes, uh, single family homes. We'll see if that bill ever gets out of committee. Uh, it's been in committee for three years. Uh, however, big New York hedge funds and private equity firms have a lot of money that can buy a lot of politicians. So I believe that we are just turning over and we will get down to that 2 to 3% Fed funds rate in the next year or two. If you've been watching the forward Fed futures, the prediction is that we'll get down to 3% Fed funds rate by the end of next year. That's what the markets are saying about interest rates. We'll see if that's true. Basically, what they did is they stretched out what they thought would happen this year into next year. And I think it's right. I thought it was early, but I think in the, in the intermediate term, it's correct. So we will see the Fed funds rate get down to 2 to 3%, not only to fund the energy transition and new home buying and new home building, really. And, and, and Congress should pass a home building tax credit. That is 5% of the Federal Home Association, the FHA loan limit. So if the loan limit where you are is $600,000 on an FHA loan, there should be a $30,000 direct tax credit that gets paid directly to your loan provider or you if you pay cash to build a new home. We'll see if they are smart enough to do something like that in Congress. They should. Uh, that would encourage all sorts of people to build a home if they had a 5% direct tax credit to do it. And that leads me to say just a couple weeks ago that the Fed is more dovish than you are giving them credit for. Because again, the narratives out there is that inflation, 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 which has been coming down, down, down for a couple of years now, the Fed would like to put us into a Goldilocks soft landing scenario. So we have gotten the soft landing already. Now it's a matter of can we invite Goldilocks to stay around for a while? Again, the election is going to matter, but the Fed is doing what they can. And they're either going to lower rates in July or signal that they're really close to lowering rates. Either way, it should work out that we get lower interest rates and that at least on the front end, we'll see the market do very well. If the Democrats win the White House, then things keep to muddling along with an upward trajectory uh, without causing many bubbles. And I really don't see any bubbles except in the mega caps. Uh, but they're monopolies, so maybe they deserve to have that kind of valuation. If Trump wins, I would expect that the folks who think that he's better for the economy will drive things up for a little while. But the combination of deregulation, bad tax policy, bad immigration policy, and bad foreign policy uh, would come home to roost relatively quickly. This is from Forest for the Trees this weekend. 335 days without a 2% down day in the stock market. I will say that sometime in July or August, that gets broken. That probably will be your signal to buy the dip in technology and QQQ. So I am looking for a 5 to 10% correction by Labor Day to buy QQQ. And that's what I want to buy. Because even though these mega caps probably are fully valued on a fundamental basis, you have so many people indexing and so many people who don't care about valuation, that they can still go higher. And Apple in particular, now that it's been reduced in the index, I think it flips. I think that Apple is probably the one that makes up price in the next year or two and gets back to one of those top two spots. Microsoft will stick. NVIDIA replaced Apple at the top two spots for the indexes, which get very heavy overweightings. I think Apple is going to take it back from NVIDIA because... NVIDIA, and everybody knows this, 
has big competition coming next year and the year after. And we will see. Not only are the big companies like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, all investing in their own chips, but you have Intel coming with their own technology, AMD out there with their own technology, Qualcomm. You have a lot of competitors for the NVIDIA chips, which clearly are on a level by themselves right now, but you're going to have a lot of firms tie them on a technological standard about two years out. Could be three, could be next year, but it's coming. The market knows it's coming. And the smart money is starting to diversify. So as the smart money diversifies away from NVIDIA, that'll put it into a choppy range as your FOMO traders are like, chase it up, sell it, buy it again. And they just do their little dance. Apple will sell a m- millions and millions of their iPhones that have AI capability. All the times that you've talked to Siri and you're like, oh, she's kind of dumb. That's going to change. Between the open AI that's on that phone, which is Microsoft, and the Apple intelligence, which is their their system, you're going to have a pretty smart personal assistant in your hand. Google is coming. The next Google Pixel will also have it, but that's maybe for next year. So if we get a pullback in Google, which is what I'm hoping for, pullback in Google is also a buy. A broader correction, I think, is to buy QQQ and if we get bigger corrections than Apple and Google and Amazon, uh, because I do think they spin off AWS as a response to Amazon marketplace flattening, they'll spin off AWS to release value. And there are only five forever stocks in this market, and I'm writing this article. The five forever stocks are Apple, the three cloud providers, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and Berkshire Hathaway. And Berkshire Hathaway isn't as sexy as those other four, but it's the strongest company in the world from a balance sheet perspective and has a broad array of high-moded companies that they own. Those are the only five forever stocks in the whole stock market. There is no other, no other, none forever stocks. Not Exxon, not AMD, not NVIDIA, none of them. They all have more cyclicality than those other five companies, but the only five forever stocks are the cloud companies, Because everything is cloud-based now, and they control most of the cloud. Those three companies control most of the cloud, like 80-something percent of the cloud are Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And by the way, you get all their other businesses. Apple, top consumer company in the world, by far, nobody's close. And Berkshire Hathaway, Fortress Balance Sheet. That doesn't mean that other companies suck. It just means that they have more cyclicality, and you can position trade them. So you could buy Meta on a 30% correction. You could buy AMD on a 20% correction. But then after they rally and they get overbought, you probably trim them and sell cover calls. These five stocks, which I have been trimming lately, uh, I intend to add back. But those are the only five forever stocks that I see in this market. They're the only ones that on a pullback are automatic buys. The only five. Because the cloud is that important. Best consumer stock in the world by far. Nothing's close and the strongest company in the world. Nothing's close. All right. Any first half of the year questions? Really? I've answered everything. I'm that awesome. I wish I had been that good at poker. I really zucked at poker this year. What will cause a 5 to 10% correction? My guess is aliens. It's usually aliens. Corrections are just sentiment driven, right? That's what a, that's what a correction is. It's, it's people taking some profits, taking a breath, reassessing You know, there's some uncertainty because of the election, but I think a lot of people believe what I believe, which is as hard as we try to break things, it always works out in the end. And that's why buying the dip is a thing. It's proven to be the best strategy for for decades, decades, really forever. Buying the dip has always been smart. So if we get a five to 10% correction, because let's go to the most horrible extreme, because there's a terrorist attack or there is an uptick in in inflation or, you know, Trump and Biden decide to debate every night or an alien lands and says, we don't like you. Or AI becomes sentient and says, you know, all that energy that you say we need, we do. And we're going to take it from you, right? Maybe we get into a matrix situation. It's silly to ask what will cause a correction. Don't worry about it. Just know that the emotions of the market change and understand by looking at the overbought and oversold signals 
when it's more likely than not? No way to know. You can just say it's more likely right now than it was six months ago. And right now it's more likely. Does that mean it happens? Nope. But if it does, you'll want to buy it. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right, three times. We're out. Have a fabulous Independence Day on Thursday. Uh, I will be doing a Retirement Income Options and Stocks of the Week program on Monday. All right, enjoy the summer. It'll be gone before you know it. Uh, my flowers really came in great while I was gone. We got enough rain, which meant that Jolene couldn't kill them. And uh, yeah, so everything's good. I got my succulents going. They're all very happy that I'm back in the office and breathing on them. As far as poker, I'm taking the rest of the summer off. No more poker this summer. I am worn out. I played poorly. I got bad cards, and I didn't have any luck. So I hit the trifecta of losing poker. And uh, I think next year I'm only going for nine nine days would be my guess. Uh, two weeks in Vegas was too long. I think that uh, I actually got a little homesick. And then, you know, I, I caught whatever the popular disease was in Vegas. Uh, not one of the fun ones, just like a really horrible cold. So, all right, everybody, take care.